Good morning. It is good as always to see each and every one of you, and I'm glad that you're here today. Hope that you're doing well, that God has blessed your week and is blessing you already with a new week. And it's great to start off a new week with our brothers and our sisters in Christ. I thank God this morning as my wife and I prayed at our meal for the opportunity that we had to be with you. And I'm thankful to see your faces now and pray that God will keep each one of you constantly watching over you. But I am so, so grateful for your presence. There is something that teachers experience on a regular basis. Those who speak encounter it. As a matter of fact, anyone that tries to clarify something of importance will encounter this. What I'm talking about is you're trying to import a body of information. You're in the process of, especially if you're teaching, you're covering all of these different things in a specific topic. And yet, as you're doing that, there's one thing, there's a main point, if you will, that you're trying to communicate to your class, to your students, to whomever you're, you're, you're trying to communicate that, even for those that teach in a Bible class. It's something that we encounter. And you, what you find is, sometimes there are the students that get the main point before you even really get in your lesson. They already know what your main point is going to be. They know what you're, what you're driving at. Then there are those students when you've, you've worked and you've worked and you've covered it and you've, you've gone at it from every direction you can think of and they still don't seem to get it. The light hasn't yet come on and finally, if you're in public school teaching, you're forced to move on to the next section and then it seems like at the last minute, the light clicks and they get it. They understand what you're saying and you feel like, finally. And then there are those that no matter what you do, it just doesn't, they don't seem to get that main point that you're trying to get across. And then there's another group. And this happens especially when you're trying to, to bring about an understanding of a specific important principle in life. And those are the ones that it doesn't matter what you say, it doesn't matter how many ways you try to come at it, they're not going to agree with it. They're not going to accept it. For one of two reasons. One is they've already got a, a, a bias toward whatever the topic may be. They've already established in their mind uh, these preconceived ideas, no, this is the way it is. This is the way it has always been, and this is the way it must be. So therefore, you're not changing me on this. The sad thing is that Jesus kept running into this over and over again. We've already seen it twice. They complained about who he ate with, Tax collectors and sinners. No God-fearing individual who keeps the law does that. They complained not only about that, but they complained also about the fact that you don't teach your, your disciples to fast because we do that and John's disciples fast. You're just not doing that. And so now we come to something today that is really no different. You see, in their minds, these Pharisees, the teachers of the law, all these individuals, they knew the law that God had given to His people through Moses over 1,400 years earlier. And if there was something that they didn't quite understand, if they had a question about it, they'd go to their scribes, their, 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 those that studied the law on a regular basis, and they would clarify it with them, and they, oh, now this is what this passage means, this is what this text is all about, and they would... Okay, then we know what we believe in it. But then, here in their minds, here's this young upstart from, from Nazareth of all places, a man by the name of Jesus. And he's going around and he's teaching these people. He's teaching everybody, even in the synagogues. And he's just wrong. We don't agree with him. 
As a matter of fact, in their minds, there's nothing he can teach us that we don't already know. And so their thinking was, he really needs to learn from us. We need to straighten him out. We need to make sure that he gets everything down and has it right. So if he's going to continue doing what he's doing, he's at least teaching the things that we won't taught. And so we come to what we encountered and what Tommy read for us just a moment ago there in chapter 6 of Luke's Gospel. It has to do with something that he has allowed his disciples to do, which in their minds, in the Pharisees' minds, was a flagrant violation of the Sabbath law. It needed to be addressed. And yet the problem? They missed the main point. They missed the main point. Because in their minds, they already knew everything that needed to be discussed. As we look at these five verses today, I hope that what we will see is those things that we do not want to emulate in the behavior of the Pharisees so that we don't become those who, like them, Jesus would say, you're missing the main point. And in order to do that, we've got to go back and build from where Luke brings us into the story. It's a Sabbath day. And let me just clarify up front, the Sabbath is not Sunday. It was and is Saturday. It's the seventh day of the week. In six days, God said, He created the the world and everything in it, and on the seventh day, He rested. The seventh day was always what the Sabbath law was about. Not about Sunday, not about the Lord's Day, but Saturday. And it was a law that was given to the Jews. It was a part of the law of Moses. So that is something that they held very, matter of fact, it was a part of their Ten Commandments, as we'll see in a moment. But on on this particular Sabbath day, Jesus Jesus and His disciples are going through a field of grain. Now, In in Palestine in Jesus' day, the fields were laid out in long, narrow rows. And in between, or in long, narrow strips, if you will. And in between, there would be a narrow path where a person could walk through. So you'd have grain on one side, grain on the other, and there was a path to walk through. So that you're not walking right through somebody's field. And most likely, the disciples are following Jesus down the path between two fields. And as they're going along, they are doing something. Luke tells us that they're picking the heads of grain. They're going through, you can imagine, they just grab a head of grain and then they're rubbing it together in their hands and they're picking out the the seeds of grain and popping them into their mouth and eating them. Innocent enough. Wouldn't you agree? As a matter of fact, the law of Moses stipulated that it was permitted. If you go to Deuteronomy, Chapter 23, there in verse 25, here's what Moses stipulated. He said, when you enter your neighbor's standing grain, then you may pluck the heads with your hand, but you shall not wield a sickle in your neighbor's standing grain. In other words, as you're going through, if you want to pluck a few right here and and, and get you something to eat because you're hungry, that's fine. But don't go in there with your sickle and start cutting it down because... That's reaping, and that's his grain, and you don't have a right to that. But to get a few to feed yourself because you're hungry, fine, no problem. Well, the Pharisees didn't agree. They saw them doing this, apparently they saw them doing this, and they questioned their actions. We know they questioned their actions, but the real question is, I said they saw them doing this. It seems to make sense to me because they go to them and immediately confront them. So where are the Pharisees? The logical response, the logical answer seems to be, they're watching them. They're spying on them. They're paying attention. They're looking, watching them. 
waiting for them to do something that they can say, nope, 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 law says you can't do that. And that's exactly what happens here. They were keeping a close eye on them, waiting for the opportunity to pounce. Folks, it's sad but true that down through the ages there have been people just like that in the Lord's church. Individuals who have done the same thing to a brother or sister in Christ. What I mean by that is they have watched another Christian waiting for the opportunity to correct that individual, to confront that individual for some supposed transgression. And even though that Christian who committed the supposed transgression was doing what they thought was right and trying to serve God to the best of their ability, they were confronted by somebody who was showing no hint of love and no compassion for them at all. And then what has happened oftentimes to that brother or sister in Christ is that they have been intimidated to the point that they've retreated from any further service in the body of Christ in that local congregation or they have just pulled up stakes all together and walked away. I want to encourage you, let us pray that God does not allow us to imitate this behavior of the Pharisees. Because Paul wrote over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, there in verse 16, that every congregation of God's church, every body of Christ, as he puts it, is a temple of God. He says the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of God dwells in you. It dwells in this body of God's people. And then verse 17 is where he drives his point home. He said, if any man destroys the temple of God, God will destroy him. So that person who would behave like the Pharisees and just look for an opportunity to attack somebody, I'm going to straighten them out. And they don't sit down and do something in love with a true concern for that person God says, I'm going, to, I'm going to address you. You see, that's Pharisaic behavior. And we want to make sure we do not ever engage in that. But let's come back to what's going on. The Pharisees this, the, the Pharisees see this, and they, in their minds, it is wrong. These disciples are eating grain in the field. That's not the problem. The problem is they're doing it on the Sabbath day. You don't do it on the Sabbath day. It's work. And God says you don't work on the Sabbath day. What? Yeah. What you're doing is work. And God said the Sabbath is holy. Exodus 20, beginning in verse 8. Here's what he says. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male or female servant or your cattle or your sojourner who stays with you. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the Sabbath, seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Okay, then their question was, what constitutes work? And the interpreters of the law down through the years had sat down and they had come up with 39 different tasks that in their minds was a violation of working on the Sabbath day. And the disciples on that particular day in their minds would have been guilty of four. By plucking the heads of grain with their hands, you see what they had done is they were guilty, first of all, of reaping. And then as they took and rubbed it together in their hands, they would have been guilty of threshing. And then as they plucked away the chaff and threw it down so that only the seeds remain, they're guilty of winnowing. And then finally, in the process of doing all of it and eating it, oh, they're guilty of preparing a meal on the Sabbath day. So they're guilty on four counts violating the Lord's Sabbath, you would look at it and you say, as some of our young people would say today, really? 
Really? Yes, really. To them, it was a very serious matter. It's something you don't do. How does Jesus respond to that? What is his answer for that? Well, look at what he says, verse 3. He says, Have you not even read what David did when he was hungry and he and those who were with him? Jesus is taking them back to an incident in the Old Testament days that is recorded for us in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verses 1 through 6. The Pharisees were familiar with the account because they were students of the law. The problem was that the Pharisees, though they knew the story, missed a very important point in the story. Well, you have to go back and read all of that, but let me just kind of give you a synopsis of it. You see... David was God's anointed man to eventually become king of, the, of, of all Israel. Saul, who was the present king, who God had withdrawn favor from, had become very jealous, so much with rage toward David, that he wanted to do nothing but kill his son-in-law, because David was married to one of his daughters. David had to leave his home without any preparation, no food to take with him, so he and the men that were with him escaped to a place called Nob, N-O-B, which is where at that time the tabernacle was located. The priest that was serving in that tabernacle was a man by the name of Ahimelech. David goes to Ahimelech and says, Do you have five loaves of bread here or something else that might be found? He in essence explains, Me and my men are hungry. Now, he lies to Ahimelech about the reason for his travels in the first place. But he is telling the truth about being hungry. And Ahimelech tells him that the only thing that he has available is some consecrated bread. That is also known as the bread of the presence. Well, what makes that so special? The bread of the presence, every Sabbath morning, 12 fresh loaves of bread were baked. And the priest carried those 12 loaves into the tabernacle, into the holy place. And there on the north wall of the tabernacle, there was a little golden table. They would remove the 12 loaves that had been there since the previous Sabbath, and they would replace them with these 12 loaves. Each of the loaves represented one of the 12 tribes of Israel. And they were placed there in the holy place within the tabernacle in God's presence. That's why it's called the bread of the presence because it also represented God's presence among his people. The old loaves, that's where the law came in. You see, the law stipulated that the old loaves were reserved only for the priest. They were the only ones that were to eat that bread. But on this particular occasion, David ate of that consecrated bread, David and his men, Bread that was intended only for the priest by the law. And according to what we see in verse 6 of 1 Samuel chapter 21, it seems to be that it was the Sabbath day when this was done because the other had apparently just been changed out. So David violated the law. But God never held David accountable. God never condemned David or corrected David for what he had done. The problem for the Pharisees... The the real reason that there is an issue with the Pharisees is that they have not come to the Scriptures with an open mind. You see, the Pharisees are those who tend to support and come to Scripture not so much to learn God's will as they are those individuals who are looking for some proof text to prove where somebody else is wrong. And that's what they're doing with Jesus. You're violating Exodus 20 verse 8. You're violating one of the Ten Commandments. But what they'd missed is that David, who they highly respected, who was a king of Israel, perhaps the greatest king of Israel, had also violated God's commandment concerning the Sabbath and the consecrated bread and that God did not hold him accountable. And so here again, We must be careful that we do not imitate the Pharisees and come before God with an attitude that seems to say, as it seems to be of them, listen, Lord, for your servant is speaking, but with an attitude that says, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. 
We need to come to Scripture always with an open mind and say, what is it that God wants me to do? Because Jesus takes this and he brings the point out. They understand by now. Because in essence what Jesus is saying, though he doesn't say it in words, what he shared with them, they already know where he's going with this. If you condemn me and my disciples for what we've just done, then you also are condemning David and the men that were with him on that occasion for what they did. And they weren't about to condemn David. And the point that he's making is that the need, the human person, the human need is greater at times than the ceremonial law. Feeding a person who is hungry is more important than whether or not that bread is given to the priest. These men are hungry today, and what little grain they're taking, even though it is the Sabbath day, is not a violation of that law. So what is God's concern for the Sabbath? What is it that Jesus is saying? And, and you know, it's so interesting that oftentimes when you read through these Gospels, Luke will have something he brings out, Matthew will have something he brings out, Mark will have something he brings out, all on the same thing. And both Matthew and Mark bring out something that Luke does not have in his account. In Matthew chapter 12, you'll notice, well, <clears throat> before I Matthew, let me go to Mark. In Mark chapter 2, there in verse 27, here's the statement that he makes. He says, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. What are you saying? What he's saying is, first of all, man was created long before the Sabbath law was ever given. And even when God gave the Sabbath law, He did not give the Sabbath law for the purpose of making people miserable or for the Sabbath law to become a burden upon them. No, God had a different purpose for giving the Sabbath law. But that's what the Pharisees had done with it. They had attached so many regulations to the Sabbath law that it became a burden for any average Israelite to try to keep. And it had become a day of dread for them rather than a day of joy. It had become a time when they were afraid of incurring God's wrath because they might have violated one of these 39 different things that had been stipulated as if you do this, you're not keeping the Sabbath. What Jesus wanted the people that day, his disciples and Pharisees and anyone else that might have been listening and for us today to understand, especially as it concerned that, is that God gave the Sabbath as a blessing upon man. A time in which God says, you've worked for six days, rest. Your body needs it, your mind needs it. Take this time to focus upon who I am and what I've done for you. The love I have for you. Let it be a time of refreshing, a time of joy for you, not a burden. And in a similar vein, folks, this day, what Scripture calls the Lord's Day, is a similar day for us. It is a day in which we get to come together as God's people. And we get to sit in God's presence and be refreshed by Him. We come together as brothers and sisters in Christ to hear His Word read to us and then to hear it proclaimed. We come together in order to talk with Him through our prayers. We are here today to sing His praises. We are here today to remember the great love that He's shown for us through His sacrifice on the cross so long ago and to proclaim that death until He comes again. It is a day to truly rejoice because if you're a Christian here today, there's a salvation that you possess that God has made available to you and it is something that He wants you to rejoice in. It is a day that He's created. It is an opportunity He's given for us to truly appreciate the God that we have. But Matthew says something too. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus quotes from an Old Testament prophet. It is the prophet Hosea, chapter 6, verse 6. You've heard it before. He says to them, 
If you had known what this means, and then he quotes Hosea, I desire compassion or mercy and not sacrifice. He said, you would not have condemned the innocent. So he's saying, if you had known what Hosea was actually saying, you would not have condemned these men. But you don't understand what Hosea is really saying. It is God that is speaking through Hosea. I desire mercy. I desire compassion, not sacrifice. You see, what God desires far more than the ritual sacrifices that they were giving was the milk of human kindness. Each man caring for his neighbor. And God desires that each of us have a spirit in us that calls us to this kindness that we demonstrate to those around us. That we show mercy. That we show compassion. That we show love for our fellow man. And the gospel accounts are filled with evidence of how Jesus did it over and over and over again. You find him feeding the hungry, healing the sick, comforting the bereaved, casting out demons, all of the different things that he does. Why? Because he was full of compassion. And as we find Paul later say, he went about doing good. And that's what we're called to do. What are we to take from this? The last words that Matthew, Mark, and Luke all record Jesus as having spoken on those, that occasion were these words. The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. He is the one who is given charge of the Sabbath. He is the one who determines what its purpose is and what it is to accomplish. But there is something far more. I believe there's something, when you connect Scripture to Scripture, something far more that is being said here. And really to see it, you have to go back and look at something that Daniel saw in one of his visions that he records for us in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14. One night, he had this vision, and this is what he saw it's here before you. Listen, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given a kingdom and glory, or excuse me, given dominion, kingdom, and a, and a glory and a kingdom. I'll get it right here in a minute. You can read it better than I can that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. The Son of Man is Jesus Christ. The Ancient of Days is God. And God is given to His Son dominion, glory, and a kingdom. And the point that he makes is this, his dominion is an everlasting dominion. Everlasting means, as it says here, it will never go away. It's always going to be here. And not only has he given him a dominion that is everlasting, he has given him a kingdom, one that will not be destroyed. As Jesus himself said to, to his disciples, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. His kingdom is forever and ever. But here's the main point. In all of this, Son of Man, Lord, Christ, Son of God. But are you in His kingdom? Are you in His kingdom? Because if you're not in his kingdom, folks, the alternative is not good. He is going to reign forever and ever. His kingdom is what we all want to be a part of. Because with him in glory is where we want to be. If these Pharisees had truly understood who it was they were speaking with, if they really had understood, I hope and pray they would have stopped
to take thought about the things they were saying. But my goal today is to help you to understand who he is and what he's come to do. And that we are his servants. And we want to be with him eternally. At least I hope that you do. This morning, if you're not his child, if you're not in his kingdom, and if you've not confessed his name as Lord and Savior, if you've not turned away from your sin in, in true repentance and being buried, have been buried with him in baptism, you are not in his kingdom. Today, won't you do that? And if you are a child of God here today, if you are a Christian and you know, I've not lived as a faithful child of this kingdom. I have tried, I've, wor- I've continued to do what I want to do. I haven't really given my heart to him. Let us today pray with you and for you. Let us today ask God to help you start again, to forgive you of those sins which have taken you away from him. But if you need to respond, won't you come right now as together we stand and sing.